Today's project is this Our Home Sweet Home sign. I'm going to show you where to find it online. You can download the, the plans. That's free. And then I will take you step by step through the what you need to do to make this project. There's only two pieces to it and the front is in half inch thick material. It says Home Sweet Home, shape of a house, and then a backer behind that quarter inch thick material. So nothing difficult and <laughs> those letters are pretty big so this would be a good, good beginner project if you're not used to making inside cuts and cutting out letters. Uh, this is about as easy as it gets for that type of an operation. So let me go pick out some stock and we'll get started. Okay, I'm going to use poplar for the back because I'm going to paint that. And the, the back is a little bit bigger than the front. So I cut a piece of po half, half inch poplar, 7.5 by 15. I'm going to plane that down to a quarter inch first. So I'll set that aside. And then I've got a piece of red oak that was 7 by, I believe, 14 and a half. And that's ready to go, so I'll just put the patterns on there. I'm Those pieces of poplar and oak are large enough to make two of these signs. The next step of the process after cutting the wood to rough size is to attach the patterns to the wood. There are several ways to do that, and I'll leave my link to my video on nine different ways to attach patterns. My favorite method is with scroll saw tape, and that's what I'm going to use today. I'll leave a link to my source in the description. This is a double-sided tape that is semi-transparent. You roll it onto the wood, then trim it to width. For longer boards, you add tape until the board is covered. Then you go back and use your utility knife to pry up a corner of the tape and peel off the backing. Then you can apply your pattern to the tape, which holds the pattern securely while you're cutting, but which removes easily when you're done without leaving any sticky residue behind. Now that the patterns are attached, I'm going to cut this board in half to make the wood easier to manage its curl saw. I'll take the pieces to the drill press to drill the pilot holes for the inside cuts. I'll take the other piece of poplar, plane it down to one quarter inch thick, then apply the patterns for the backer. I thought I'd start with the easy part, the quarter inch backer. There was already a number three Pegasus modified geometry blade in the scroll saw from my last project, which is the blade I would have chosen anyway. I make my blade choices by taking into account the thickness and hardness of the wood, as well as the complexity of the pattern. If you'd like more information on that subject, I'll leave a link to my video on blade choice sizes on the screen and in the description. Notice that when the scroll saw is not in use, I take the tension off the blade. I tightened the blade in the upper blade holder, flipped up the tension lever, then plucked the blade to check it for proper tightness. If you get a musical note, the blade is tensioned properly, but if all you get is a dull thud, the blade needs adjustment. You want to make that correction before you start cutting. Two accessories I recommend for use with scroll saw are a foot switch and a lighted magnifier. You obviously can't see the foot switch here, but you plug your scroll saw into the foot switch, then plug the switch into an outlet. You leave the on-off switch on the scroll saw in the on position, and then it will start cutting as soon as you press down on the foot switch. Remove your foot pressure, and the saw stops. This allows you to keep both hands on the workpiece at all times for better control. The lighted magnifier gives you a much closer view of the cutting lines for scroll saw work. Even for a pattern as simple as this backer, it's a big help in following the line as closely as possible. For patterns with lots of detail, the magnifier takes the strain out of following the lines. I'm not using the light at this time because when I'm recording video, the light has a tendency to make the picture too bright and it washes out some of the detail. But I use it all the time when I'm not recording. The Pegasus scroll saw, Pegasus modified geometry blades, and the two accessories I just mentioned are all available from Bear Wood Supply. I'll leave a link to their website in the description. I'm an affiliate, so I'll receive a small commission on any orders placed using that link. I made quick work of that backer, and now I'll show you one of the reasons I like scroll saw tape so much. Once you're done cutting, you just get a finger under a corner, lift the tape up, and peel it off. Most of the time it comes off in one piece, and it doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. With the backer done, it's time to move on to the front piece. 
Where the back was quarter inch poplar, the front is half inch thick red oak. The wood is thicker and harder, so that calls for a larger blade. And the next size up will be a number five Pegasus modified geometry blade. Since I'm making inside cuts with some amount of detail, I know that size will work. A number seven blade would cut faster, but it won't maneuver as tightly as a number five. So I picked one up from my blade holder that I keep just to the left of the scroll saw. I had already drilled the pilot holes over at my drill press. If you don't have a drill press, a hand drill will do the job just as well. It doesn't matter what order you make the cuts in, but I generally start at the top and work from left to right, just as if I was reading a book. I blame it on my German heritage and military training, but I usually work in a logical manner. In general, I aim to cut right on the line for most patterns. However, I always make an exception for cutting out letters. For that task, I make my cuts so they are just touching the inside of the line. My reasoning is that letters on a pattern are frequently close together, and I need to be careful that the cuts do not sneak over the line even a tiny bit. If they do, I run the chance of the cuts from two adjacent letters touching each other. At best, this won't look good. At worst, it can ruin an entire project. I threaded the blade through the pilot hole, then secured it in the upper blade holder. Next, I made a cut from the pilot hole into one of the corners, stopping the cut right at the intersection. Then I backed the blade up to the pilot hole, swiveled the workpiece 180 degrees, and backed the dull end of the blade all the way to the intersection. Using the kerf the blade created when I made the cut, I was able to turn the workpiece 90 degrees so it was facing in the direction I wanted to cut next. I started feeding the workpiece into the blade again until I reached the next intersection. After cutting to the point of the next angle I needed to make, I backed off the blade pressure almost imperceptibly so it was no longer cutting, then used the saw kerf plus the action of the still moving blade to turn the workpiece in the next direction I wanted to cut. As soon as the blade was properly aligned, I put pressure back on the wood to feed it into the saw blade once again until I reached the next intersection, then used the same technique to cut the sharp corner. Oops, I goofed. I could have edited out this mistake on my part, but I'm not afraid to admit I still flub things up. What happened here is that I didn't have the bottom blade holder tight enough, and over time the blade worked itself loose. I slowed the video down so you could get a better view of what happened. When the blade came loose from the bottom, the tension lever on the top flipped open, and that startled me a little bit. Because I used a foot switch, I immediately lifted my foot to take the pressure off the switch, and the saw came to a complete stop. The blade was bent in the process, ruining it, but that was a small price to pay. Since I have to replace the blade, this gives me an opportunity to pass along a little tip. Scroll saw blades are small, with very fine teeth, and there is a top and bottom for most blade types. The Pegasus Modified Geometry Blades feature a reverse tooth design, which means that there are teeth cutting on both the downstrokes and upstrokes of the saw. It's one of the reasons they cut so smoothly and cleanly. But how do you know which way to mount the blade? Because it does matter. I take the blade in my right hand and run the teeth gently across the thumb of my left hand, noting how much resistance I feel. Then I flip the blade around and run it across my thumb in the other direction. Whatever direction provides the most resistance is the side I want to face down because I want to do most of the cutting on the downstroke of the saw blade. The next part of the project is a matter of repetition. Thread the scroll saw blade through a pilot hole, cut out a letter, then move the blade to the next pilot hole. This project has a relatively small number of large cuts. I've made project projects with a large number of small cuts and about every possibility in between. Scroll sawing takes time and patience. I usually listen to classic rock music while I work, but for copyright reasons, I can't let anything like that play in my shop while I'm recording video. Obviously, you can listen to anything you like in your own shop. Maybe you'd like to leave a comment and let me know what you listen to while you're in your shop. Once I finished cutting the letters, I made the long cut along the outside of the house shape. The waste piece along the outside wasn't big enough to keep, so I just tossed it into the waste basket I keep right next to the scroll saw. The scroll saw tape peeled off in one piece, as usual. I noticed while I was cutting the house shape that the oak piece had a slight bow to it, and you can clearly see that as I hold it against the backer piece. I'm not worried about it, though, because when I glue and clamp these pieces together, that will pull the top flat against the backer. I decided to paint the 
Thacker's blue, as the plan showed, and those parts are not dry, so I'm ready for the glue up. You can see the bow in these top pieces as I press them down, but I'm sure the glue and clamps will cure that little problem. For most of my projects, I use white glue. I purchase it in gallon bottles, then use the large bottle to refill small applicators like this one. This has a tip tiny enough to apply very small beads of glue in between the letter cutouts. The white glue is water-based, so I can use my finger to spread it as evenly as possible. Another useful quality of this glue is that it dries clear, so any squeeze-out that may occur after clamping will not be noticeable later. I use the combination of spring clamps and F clamps for this. I like the spring clamps because they are quick and easy, and you can get them placed close together if need be. The problem with F clamps is that when you go to tighten them, the circular motion of the tightening screw can cause the position of the pieces to shift slightly. I use the spring clamps for most places on these, but I felt the extra pressure provided by the F clamps was needed in the top and bottom middle spots to counteract that slight bow in the oak tops. I'll set these aside for the glue to take effect and dry, then I'll complete them with a couple coats of spray polyurethane. The finish will bring out the oak grain and protect both the oak and paint to make these decorations useful for years to come. Here's one of the completed Our Home Sweet Home wall hangings after adding the polyurethane finish. I need to look for some appropriate cord to string through the two eyelets at the top to make it complete. I appreciate and respond to every comment, so let me know what you think. If you're still in a woodworking frame of mind, a suggestion for the next video to watch will be on the screen right now.